Before we start today's video, we want to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, Hunt a Killer. I don't know about you, but I love autumn and Halloween. It's my favorite time of the year. The problem is that with the weather getting colder and the ongoing pandemic, there's going to be less to do than usual. Sure, horror movie marathons will be fun, but they're bound to get boring after a while. That's why I'm so excited to play Hunt a Killer every month. It's something creepy and interesting I can do in the safety of my own home. It's also an inexpensive and fun game night. Every season of Hunter Killer, you are trying to solve a murder with clues that arrive in a box every month. The clues are high quality, and they look like props from the set of a TV show or a movie. The storylines and the characters are really well thought out, so it's easy to lose yourself in the game. I'm not the only one who loves Hunter Killer. They have over 100,000 active subscribers and over 2,000 five-star reviews. Check out Hunter Killer yourself by going to hunterkillercom slash listed and use the promo code criminally listed at the checkout to get 20% off your first box. Once again, make sure you use the promo code criminally listed. Get Hunter Killer today so you have something fun and original to do at home and you'll also be supporting criminally listed. Do you have what it takes to hunt a killer? Number 3. The Sons of Satan Sometime after midnight on June 2nd, 1970, an ambulance pulled into a gas station in Santa Ana, California. Typically, the night manager, 21-year-old Jerry Carlin, greeted the paramedics. Carlin had recently gotten married, and unbeknownst to him at the time, his wife was pregnant with her first child. But that night, Carlin didn't appear to be around. One of the paramedics went inside the store and the other headed to the washroom. When the paramedic opened the door to the washroom, he was startled by what he found. It was the dead body of 21-year-old Jerry Carlin. He had been bound and bludgeoned to death. The medical examiner later determined he was beaten to death with the blunt side of a hatchet or a small axe. The paramedics immediately called the police. The police determined that about $50 had been stolen. Also, Carlin was known to wear Levi's jean jacket. The jacket was missing from the gas station. Two days later, on June 4th, 1970, 31-year-old mother of five, Florence Brown, was reported missing. Brown was a school teacher who specialized in helping children with special needs. She was last seen at a diner in Irvine, California. A few days earlier, school officials had coffee at the diner, but for some reason, they did not pay the check. Brown went to the diner and paid the check. That was the last known sighting of her. A week later, the burnt-out shell of Brown's car was found in Santa Cruz, California, which is about 380 miles from where she was last seen. But there were no signs as to what happened to the mother of five. Eleven days later, the remains of a woman were found in a shallow grave near Al Cariso, California. She had been stabbed 21 times in the back with a large knife. Her right arm had been severed at the shoulder. Strips of flesh were missing from her right leg. Also, three ribs had been removed and her heart and lungs were missing. Two days later, the remains were identified as Florence Brown. At the time, the police had no reason to suspect that the murders of Jerry Carlin and Florence Brown were connected. A little more than a week after Brown's remains were identified, the police arrested a 21-year-old transient man. The police noted he was wearing a Levi's jean jacket that was stained with blood. This was important because Jerry Carlin's Levi's jacket was stolen from the gas station when he was murdered. The police questioned the man regarding the robbery and he swore he had nothing to do with it. He said that the jacket was given to him by a 20-year-old man named Stephen Craig Hurd. 
Heard was arrested a few days later on June 26, 1970. Heard explained he was the leader of a satanic cult called the Sons of Satan. The cult had about a dozen members. They were all young, homeless drug addicts. At times, they would sacrifice animals to Satan. While the cult had a dozen members, Heard had an inner circle that consisted of three young men and a 31-year-old woman. The young men were Christopher Gibney and Herman Taylor, who were both 17, and 16-year-old Arthur Hulse, who went by the nickname Moose. The 31-year-old woman was a waitress with a drug problem named Melanie Daniels. The inner circle of the cult decided it was okay to kill people if it was in the name of Satan. It was even better if they took a body part and sacrificed it to Satan. Her explained to the police that he wanted to travel to San Francisco, California so he could meet Anton Levy, who was the founder of the Church of Satan. The problem with this plan was that he didn't have any money. He had access to a car, but he didn't have any money to buy gas. So the call came up with what they thought was an elegant solution. They would simply rob a gas station and fill up the gas tank when they did. Hers said that after midnight on June 2nd, 1970, he, Arthur Hulse, and Herman Taylor went to the gas station where Jerry Carlin worked. They forced Carlin into the washroom and then Hulse killed Carlin with a Boy Scouts hatchet. He supposedly licked the blood off the hatchet afterward. They filled up the car with gas, stole the money from the register, and took Carlin's jacket. They went back to a motel room where they were crashing. The Melanie Daniels washed the blood off the hatchet. The police thought that this was the end of her confession, but he had more to tell. Heard explained that on June 4th, they were planning on heading to San Francisco, but their car had stopped working. So they needed a new car. Melanie Daniel saw Florence Brown in her car alone parked at a red light, and she told her to carjack her. Heard said that he, Herbert Taylor, and Christopher Gibney piled into her car and took her hostage. They drove her to an orange grove near UC Irvine. In a satanic ritual, they murdered 31-year-old Florence Brown. Her claims they consumed some of the body. Hulse joined them and they drove out to Al Carrizo where they buried the body. Then they drove towards Santa Ana. Along the way, they stopped at San Quentin Prison where they visited some friends. When they got to Santa Ana, they torched Brown's vehicle and they split up. They had apparently abandoned their plan to go meet Anton Levy. Heard would later say that a few days after Brown's murder, he traveled back to the area where they buried her body. He claimed he removed the heart and he ate it. After Heard's confession, the five members of the cult who took part in the murders were all arrested. Before her could go to trial, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and he was deemed unfit to stand trial. So he was sent to a psychiatric hospital. Arthur Halls went to trial for first degree murder for the killing of Jerry Carlin in February 1971. Even though he was 16 at the time of the murder, he was tried as an adult. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. Herman Taylor pleaded guilty to accessory to murder and he was given five years of probation. Christopher Gibney pleaded guilty to second degree murder as a juvenile. He was taken into the custody of the California Youth Authority it is unclear how much time he served. Melanie Daniels was sentenced to two concurrent five-year sentences for being an accessory to the murders. 
1975, Stephen Hurd, the ringleader of the Sons of Satan, was deemed fit to stand trial. He went to trial for both murders in May 1975. Hurd was found guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. He was eligible for parole after just seven years. Hurd applied for parole seven times, but he was never released. He died in prison in 2005 at the age of 55 from a brain hemorrhage. When he died, the California Department of Corrections did not issue a press release or notify the district attorney. As a result, the news of Hurd's death was not made public until 2010 when newspaper checked on his status. Arthur Hulse was granted parole in 2015, but then the governor of California blocked it. Hulse was granted parole again the next year, and once again, the governor blocked it. A search of the California inmates database did not reveal Hulse's current status or whereabouts. This suggests that he was either paroled or he died, and just like with Stephen Hurd, the California Department of Corrections did not issue a press release or notify the district attorney. Number 2. The Family David Bruce Longo was born in November 1938 in Yonkers, New York. His father was a doctor and his mother was a homemaker. His family was Episcopalian. Longo graduated from high school in 1956 and then he joined the Marine Corps. In the Marines, Longo was introduced to Mormonism, also known as the Church of Latter-day Saints. In 1958, he was baptized into the Church of Latter-day Saints. Longo was a devout Mormon who could quote the Book of Mormon from memory. In 1960, he went to Uruguay for his two years of missionary work. However, he was released from his service early because he started hearing voices. He returned to his hometown and spent some time in the hospital because he was mentally ill. In 1961, Longo started attending school at Brigham Young University in Salt Lake City, Utah. He majored in Spanish and political science. In the winter of that year, he started dating fellow student Margaret Erickson. They were married not long afterward. Longo graduated in 1965. At that point, the couple had two daughters and a son. After Longo graduated, he would meet and preach to three of his friends, Sterling Peacock, Gil Hibben, and Paul Chipman. Longo claimed he was a direct descendant of the House of David. To reflect that, he started using the name Emmanuel David. Emmanuel proclaimed that he, his followers, and his family were the true Israelites. He also said that the Star of David was a symbol for his followers and it shouldn't be associated with Judaism. He also declared that he was God and the Father of Jesus. Emmanuel predicted he was going to become the leader of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Instead, he was excommunicated from the church in June 1969. His followers were excommunicated shortly afterward. Emmanuel, his family, and his followers lived in a commune in Manti, Utah. His cult, called the Family David, had about a dozen members. By that time, Emmanuel and Margaret, who was now going by the name Rachel David, had three daughters and one son. Emmanuel's followers also changed their names, taking on the last name David. Emmanuel and his followers thought that they were reincarnations of biblical figures. So their new first names reflected that. Sterling Peacock became Matthias David, Paul Chipman took on the name Jonathan David, Miguel Hippen started going by the name Peter David. In 1974, Matthias and Jonathan moved to Spokane, Washington. 
Matthias was an expert in karate and they opened a karate studio. The profits were sent to Emmanuel to support him and his growing family. By 1972, Emmanuel and Rachel had seven children. The children also had biblical names. The eldest child had the same name as their mother, Rachel. The other children's names were Elizabeth, Joshua, Deborah, Joseph, David, and Rebecca. Between June 1975 and January 1976, Emmanuel and his family lived in a motel in Missoula, Montana. At the start of 1976, Emmanuel started to believe that his three most devoted followers, Matthias, Peter, and Jonathan, were archangels. Emmanuel also had visions that the American government would collapse and he would emerge as its new leader. He told Matthias and Jonathan to sell their karate studio and move to Washington, D.C. to await the collapse. They did as they were ordered. But after moving to D.C., they quickly ran out of money and ended up living on the streets. Yet, they never lost their faith in Emmanuel. Emmanuel and his family left the motel in Missoula in January 1976 without paying their $6,000 bill. They moved to Salt Lake City, Utah, and they lived in another hotel. In 1977, the FBI started investigating the cult's financial dealings. Matthias and Peter were both arrested for wire fraud. They were accused of making up hard luck stories and asking people for money over telegrams and the telephone. Often, these were people Matthias and Peter knew from when they were members of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Their stories would often involve a fictitious daughter who was starving and they needed money to feed her. The people would then wire the money. In turn, they sent the money to Emmanuel. In May 1978, Matthias pleaded guilty to wire fraud and he was sentenced to five years in federal prison. The FBI was also investigating Emmanuel David. In May 1977, Emmanuel and his family moved into the International Dunes Hotel in Salt Lake City. Neither Emmanuel nor Rachel had a job, but yet they were able to pay for their $90 a night hotel room in cash. They would often order in food from an expensive French restaurant. They lived this way for several months. On July 31, 1978, 39-year-old Emmanuel David borrowed a truck from a friend. He drove to Emigration Canyon, which is just outside of Salt Lake City. He put one end of the hose in the exhaust pipe and the other end of the hose in the cab of the pickup truck. He then turned on the truck and inhaled the fumes. His dead body was found two days later. The official cause of death was carbon monoxide poisoning. The police did not find a suicide note. In his pockets was $5. That night, Rachel was notified that her husband had been found dead. The next morning, Rachel woke up her seven children. They went to the balcony of their 11th floor hotel room. 15-year-old Rachel, who had the same name as her mother, 14-year-old Elizabeth, and 13-year-old Joshua, used chairs to climb over the railing, and then they jumped. Rachel then threw 12-year-old Deborah, 9-year-old Joseph, 8-year-old David, and 6-year-old Rebecca over the railing. 38-year-old Rachel then jumped from the balcony herself. The mother and four of her children died on sight. Three of the children were taken to the hospital. Two were pronounced dead shortly after they arrived at the hospital. The eldest child, 15-year-old Rachel, ultimately survived the 100-foot fall. 
Rachel was left with brain damage and she was confined to a wheelchair. The police believe that Emanuel killed himself because he knew that the FBI was closing in on him. Also, he had probably ran out of money. The police believe that Rachel killed herself and her children because she couldn't live without her husband. In 1993, Rachel David, the lone survivor of the David family, was living with her uncle. Rachel, who was 30, was interviewed by a reporter with a television show, Inside Edition. She said that the deaths of her family members were ordained. She claimed in the 15 years since the death of her family, she had tried to take her own life several times. She also said that she believes her father will return to Earth. In 2000, Rachel was living with Matthias David, who was a prominent figure in the cult. They were living in Spokane, Washington, where Matthias ran a martial arts studio. He had even trained officers with the Spokane Police Department in self-defense. Matthias said that he still believes that Emmanuel David is God. He was not the only person. There were still about a dozen members of the cult that lived in Spokane and Denver. Matthias wanted to clarify that they were not a cult. He said he just used them as extended family. Rachel lived with Matthias until 2005 and then she was sent to live at a care center in Idaho. In 2008, Matthias sent letters to the media and leaders of the Church of Latter-day Saints. In the letters, he stated that he believes that fire will rain down from the sky and destroy the enemies of the family David. He also believes that Mount Timbinokas, which is a mountain in Utah, will be picked up and dropped on Manti, which is where the cult had their commune. However, Matthias clarified that he does not support violence. He also does not encourage any members of his group to die by suicide. Since 2008, the family David has stayed out of the news and it's unknown if they are still active. Number one, the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. Uganda is a country in East Central Africa. In 1980, the country had a population of about 12 million people. They had experienced a war that led to their president, Idi Amin, being overthrown. Amin was a brutal dictator known as the Butcher of Uganda. He had ruthlessly ruled the country from 1971 to 1979. Bladina Busije lived in the Rukungiri district, which is in the western region of Uganda. Sometime in 1980, Busije said she was on a hill in the district. She claimed that the Virgin Mary appeared to her and told her that the end of the world was coming. Busije said that the Virgin Mary told her to get people to follow the Ten Commandments so that they could enter heaven. Word of CJ's vision spread and people started flocking to her. That same year, Uganda was thrown into a civil war that would last for nearly five and a half years. Also, the AIDS epidemic was ravaging the country. But yet, people from all over the country kept traveling to the Rukungiri district to join CJ. One of those people was Fredonia Marindi. Marindi was born in 1952 in Uganda. She had been married five times. She had been a shopkeeper, she had sold bootleg banana wine, and she had also been a sex worker. Marindi claimed that she had her own visions of the Virgin Mary, and she eventually took over the cult. In 1989, Marindi convinced a man named Joseph Kowiptree to join the group. Kwibtree was born in 1932 in Uganda. He had worked as a school teacher and he owned a high school. 
Whiptree had also worked in several government jobs and he ran for office in 1880. He was the father of 16 children. He was a devout Catholic who had built a church on his family's property. He was a firm believer in messages that people received from visions. Together, Quiptree and Merindi founded the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God in 1989. Merindi was called the programmer and she was considered the leader of the group. Quiptree was considered the bishop and he was Merindi's right-hand man. She mostly used Quiptree because of his political connections. Quiptree and Merindi preached that the end of days was near. They said cement blocks and giant snakes would rain from the sky and kill all the sinners. This would be followed by three days of darkness. But everyone in their camps would remain safe. After the three days of darkness, the cult would inherit the earth and they would be able to talk to Jesus directly. The cult had strict rules for its followers. Members had to sell their property and give the profits to the cult's leaders. Cult members were not allowed to talk to each other directly. Instead, they had to use sign language. However, the cult members had busy daily schedules, so they had little time to communicate with each other. They also split up families. Husbands, wives, and even children would be sent to different camps. Sex, even between married couples, was forbidden. Despite these strict rules, the cult grew from 200 people to over a thousand people. In the late 1990s, the leaders of the cult proclaimed that the apocalypse would happen on December 31st, 1999. Obviously, the world didn't end on that day. Corinda Marindi then told her followers that the Virgin Mary would appear to her between March 16th and March 18th and she would deliver a new message. While most of the cult members believed Marindi, quite a few had become disillusioned with the cult. They asked that the money that they gave the cult be returned to them. Marindi said that when the Virgin Mary appeared in March, Mary would refund the money. Marindi and the other cult leaders all told the members to go to a town in western Uganda called Kununu. There was going to be a party on March 17, 2000. The members were encouraged to invite their friends and family. People who were associated with the cult, like the men who provided them with beef, were also invited to the party. Shortly after the party started on March 17th, the locals heard a loud explosion. Authorities went to the church and found it on fire. The doors and the windows had all been nailed shut. The fire was put out and inside the church were hundreds of dead bodies. There were no signs of anyone trying to escape. It was later determined that the people inside the church were poisoned. In total, it's believed that 530 men, women, and children died in the church. The police determined that the cult leaders had been playing the mass murder for at least a week. Days before the fire, they bought 36 jerry cans worth of gas. They also bought 40 gallons of sulfuric acid, which the police believe caused the explosion. Also, in the week leading up to the massacre, the cult had sold off a lot of property and items. The police went around to the camps and properties owned by the cult. They found hundreds of more bodies buried on the properties. The official death toll, including those who died in the church, is 923 people. The police believe that there may be more bodies buried that they just didn't find. Initially, the police thought that the leaders of the church, including Joseph Quiptree and Cordonia Merindi, died in the church fire. But since the bodies were so severely damaged, 
Many people could not be identified. The police now think that Quibtree and Marindi fled the country before the massacre. No one has ever been arrested in connection with the murders of the 923 members of the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. In 2014, there were reports that Quibtree was hiding in Malawi, which is a country in southeastern Africa. However, those sightings have never been confirmed. If Joseph Quibtree is still alive today, he is 88 years old. Cordonia Marindi, if she is still alive at the time of this video, is 68 years old. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you found it interesting, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, if you are looking for something new to watch, why not check out my new channel, Chapter Dark. The videos are mysteries that you can try and solve. Do you have what it takes to solve these mysteries? You can find a link to Chapter Dark in the description box below. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.